Show us in this time how to live as your children, fully accepted by you. Then enable us through your spirit to share your light and love with others. In Jesus' name, amen. Please rise and body your spirit and join in our opening hymn number 164, Arise Your Life to Come. of God's love among us. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through Him, and without Him not one thing came into being. What has come into being in Him was life, and that life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness does not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but came to testify to the light. The true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world came into being through him. Yet the world did not know him. He came to what was his own, and his own people did not accept him. 
but to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God, who were born not of blood, or of the will of the flesh, or of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh, and lived among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory of the Father's Son, full of grace and truth. John testified to him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks ahead of me, because he was before me. From his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. The law indeed was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. It is God, the only Son, who is close to the Father's heart, who has made him known. May God add a blessing of understanding to our hearing of these words. Let us pray. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts and spirits be inspired by your Holy Spirit and thus may pleasing to you our rock and our redeemer. Amen. There are just some questions that people have grappled with for decades and not come up with any good answer. Perhaps you've been grappling with one of those yourselves in recent days. By what day must the Christmas decorations come down at the very last? It's, I've seen trees out by the curb on the morning of December 26. Apparently those people have never heard that Christmas starts on January 25th and lasts 12 days. Some believe that December 31st, the New Year's Eve, is the proper day to take down all the decorations, to put aside that holiday nonsense and get on with the reality of the New Year. Some cities and towns have even passed ordinances declaring that Christmas decorations outside must all be taken in by some predetermined date. They levy fines for those holly jolly outlaws who would dare keep them up one more day. And when to undeck the hall is such an important question that the Church of England has actually weighed in on it. They have declared that the twelfth night, January 6th, is the day that they must be taken down. And January 6th may not be such a bad guideline. After all, it's epiphany when Christians retell the story, the Christmas story of the Magi, who come from the East bringing their gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh to visit the child who they believe will be the new king, all guided by the first GPS of that rising star. And we'll share that story next Sunday. For today, today we have another Christmas story to share. The one that we just heard from the beginning of the Gospel of John. And while this one doesn't include Mary and Joseph and a baby, there aren't any angels and shepherds depicted, as in so many of our Christmas decorations. It's still one that is revealed in our choice of holiday adornments. John shares that the light, the Christmas light, has come and now stays in our world. And nothing is ever the same, even darkness. Before I continue, I want to point out that darkness is not inherently bad or evil. After all, how many people who work third shift try desperately to get their rooms as dark as possible so that they can get a good night's sleep in the daylight hours. 
And migraine sufferers can tell you about the instant relief and decrease of pain that comes when they walk into a dark room from a light one. And of course, it's only in the darkness that we can see the beauty of the stars and the planets and the universe and the wonders such as the northern lights that appear in our skies. And light is not always welcomed. How many of you have been blinded by the glare of sun off a snowbank as you try to drive down the road? Yet over the centuries, darkness has often been equated as being evil and light itself as being good, and then wrongly shifted from talking about the level of light to the color of the skin. Yet still, as the audience of John's Gospel knew too well, the absence of light can make for dangers or cover for others that are there. From robbers, to the movement of enemy forces, to hazards such as holes or cliffs as you travel along at night. In our day, dubious acts are often described as happening in the shadows no matter the actual light level in which they occurred. And we all know that being in the dark, the pitch dark, can be scary as we lose bearings. Ask any child who has awoken terrified from a nightmare how frightening the dark can be. All this makes darkness an appropriate way to describe when things are not going well for us when there is much to mourn or struggle against. For it can feel in those times as if we have lost our bearings and we can't see anything to reorient ourselves upon. There can be dark times in a nation when a tragedy happens, as well as ongoing struggles such as those we face going into the third year of a pandemic that has affected our whole world. There are the more personal ones that seem to be here either for a season or ones that seem to last longer than anyone ever thought they could bear. Whenever hatred, oppression, or violence seems to be determining the course of the world, or when losses, betrayals, and hurts invade our personal lives or the lives of our communities, darkness can seem an apt description, and to be unending, even victorious. It certainly seemed for many that way, for those who were living during the times that John was first written. The Roman Empire was at the height of its power. The peace of Rome, Pax Romana, enforced by the brute force of their overpowering military. Most of those who lived in the occupied lands, such as Israel, struggled to survive, while the elite and taxes made for only two classes, the aristocrats who had it all and the poor who had none. There was no middle class. Rome had held itself as the light to the world. But for most people in those days, that light didn't seem to shine upon them. They lived in the darkness cast by the shadows of them above, as well as their own personal struggles and tragedies. And nothing seemed to penetrate it. And so the author of John offers his Christmas story to this world and to ours. John tells of how what has existed since before the beginning of time is being revealed anew among them. A light that pierces the darkness and leads to a different way. God is sending the light into the world not only to illuminate it with God's love, but to become part of the world in order to enact God's grace that has been present and available since the beginning of time. Yes, John says, there is darkness, but if one can recognize it, 
we can also see that there is still light. Author Jennifer Epperson discovered the power that even the smallest of lights can bring in such darkness. She writes that she was already less than thrilled with Christmas decorations at this stage in her adult life. Snowflake die cuts and strings of tinsel, so much somber reflections on all the things that had not worked out as planned for her. For her, that past year had been full of what she described as lemons, ending with her being laid off from her job in early December. So when Christmas time came, she was initially opposed when her roommates suggested adding to their few Christmas decorations a small string of white lights around the window in their common room. Plugging in those lights each night interfered with her resolve to be miserable and to feel sorry for herself after all the real difficulties she had endured that year. And then one day, as if to punctuate everything else that had gone wrong, an unanticipated automatic payment withdrawal overdrew her checking account. Miserable, that evening, she reflexively plugged in those lights. <coughs> I paced our small apartment amidst their glow, she writes, as I accepted the embarrassing reality that I'd be borrowing from friends and family as a 33-year-old. And just like that, as I was taking in our common space through tear-soaked eyes, something shifted. The lights glow made things feel a little less bleak. In fact, the string of lights gave me a sense of calm. Everything they illuminated looked vibrant and full of possibility. Standing in our common space with only pocket change to my name, I suddenly felt so much gratitude for the life my roommate and I had built together. Sure, we had no closets and we could hear the J train crossing the bridge at night. But our apartment was full of all the items we needed and held plenty of the things that we loved. However immediately stressful my situation was, it was just a temporary financial setback. And without the forceful cheeriness of the lights, I would have completely missed the opportunity to acknowledge my blessings. Instead, I would have curled up in a fetal position, watched reality TV at a depressingly low value, and cursed the bad hand I'd been dealt. So, with her roommate's agreement, they kept the Christmas lights up all year. Keeping them up year-round has served as a visual cue that reminds me to ruminate less on what's going wrong so that I can focus more on all the things I already have to be grateful for. And every moment spent in that kind of presence is a moment worth celebrating. Those Christmas lights reminded Jennifer that she could celebrate the presence of a grateful spirit within herself, even when things were going wrong. And while we too can celebrate the presence of a grateful spirit, for those of us who follow the ways of Jesus, twinkling Christmas lights also remind us of another presence available to us. It is the one that we celebrate each December as coming into being in a new way, a visible, tangible way in a baby. During Christmas, we celebrate the one who brings life itself, a life that fills this world and us with light. Through Christ, we can experience the graces upon graces that enable us to spend less time dwelling within what is wrong or life-sapping, and more on what God is creating, on God's life-bringing and often surprisingly new possibilities that come out of God's ways. For the Christmas light reminds us that not only is there God's presence in the world, 
even more wondrously in Christ, the Word has become flesh among us. Lived among us in John doesn't capture the real meaning of the word in Greek that is translated into English here. Literally, it is that God has chosen to pitch God's tent among us. In the same way that God chose to travel with the Hebrews throughout the Exodus in a cloud of fire and smoke, and the commandments were placed each night in a tent, a tabernacle among them, we experience in Christ that God chooses to dwell among us. As God led the Hebrews out of slavery into freedom, God still leads us, freeing us individually and as communities for whatever holds us back from experiencing the abundant, grace-filled life that the light not only reveals, but makes possible. We are called not only to experience that light, but then to become a reflection of it, beckoning a world to believe that a better world is not only possible, but that it will and can come into being. We are offered the opportunity when we see the light to reflect the light calling us home to our Creator that grounds us in God's love and lifts us up even in the darkest of times. And then we are reminded that we are held by that light, the light that gathers and keeps us, beckoning us to join in the graces upon graces offered in life, and to come sing aloud on the height of Zion and be radiant over the goodness of the Lord. In this new year, I invite you to resolve to not only notice the light, but to shine within the light of Christ. Together, as a community of faith, we can cast God's vision of life abundant and full before us into the world by looking and recognizing the graces that are already there. This isn't to deny that these past years have been hard for us nationally, perhaps individually, and for this congregation. But it's also the possibility to recognize that within those difficult times of pain and hurt, that we can also see that God's light dwells there, even there, bringing about a new, unexpected life. And then we can shine with that newness and with that fullness of life. We can shine and believe that our mourning can turn to joy, our emptiness can be filled, our brokenness made whole, and our dis-ease can be healed. We can believe in it, commit to it, envision it, and most importantly, become it. For as we are reminded in John, the story of Christmas does not end when the nativity scenes are put away, the trees are taken down, and we begin to focus more on the man than on the baby born in Bethlehem. For the Christmas story continues to be written each day through our experiences of a God who longs so much to be with us that God even pitched a tent in the midst of us, ready to pull up stakes and go wherever we may go. All so we wouldn't be alone. All so that even in our darkest moments, we know that not only is there a God, who is present, but who loves and cares for us, no matter how it may seem. And so this Christ mass light can never be taken down until next year or declared to be out of season. Yes, there is darkness in the world, 
but there is also light. And the darkness has not, does not, and will not ever overcome that light. Amen. Please join in our next hymn, hymn 160. Hark the herald angels sing, Jesus the light in the world. Thursday when I arrived here to Wisconsin, 
I can give you the full long story, but the short details of it is that in the beginning of December, he had a cyst which turned into an abscess which got infected and he was in the hospital for two weeks. He is recovering fine, but we made the decision that rather than try to continue wound and infection care with a new set of doctors getting them in place over the end of the year, that he would stay down in Florida and that he will join me as soon as that is over. Though I do have a slight suspicion that the warmer Florida weather might have played a factor in his part of the decision. <laughs> so I'd like now to share any joys and concerns that you might have so that we may lift them up in prayer. Right, let us take this time and first in silence and then with words. Lift up our hearts and our minds in prayer. Holy One, we start a new year filled with differing emotions. Some of us are hopeful, filled with anticipation, while others may be facing this new year with trepidation, even a little bit of fear. Perhaps some are reluctant to feel anything at all, too hurt by the situations in the past, angry with the actions or in actions of some, are too afraid to be let down again. No matter where we are as we enter this new year, fill us with your light that creates new life and promises joy even in the midst of hurt. Begging us to enter into the life that your light offers one that is full of abundance in ways we cannot imagine. One that brings us together with grace so that we can then offer grace and love to others. And as this congregation and I enter into the first days of this new relationship, provide us the grace to get to know each other so that as we minister in your name, we can rejoice together, grieve what needed with each other, and fully embrace our common life in this time so that we may reflect your life in this community and beyond. And as the yoke begins with hope you see in this congregation, help us to see how you are bringing new life and possibilities to this congregation out of it as well as spreading each congregation's efforts further into the world. For there are so many ways we long to reflect your light into the world, O oh God, so many places in need of that light. Sometimes we are too focused on our own challenges and obstacles, and we miss the pain and difficulties of others you call us to reach out to. If we are tempted to pack away the light of Christmas because the holidays have ended, remind us that you enable us to reflect your light each day of the year. Mold us into people who can not only see your graces in our own lives, but that are inspired to reach out with the same towards all others. For as we enter into another winter, where COVID has dashed many expectations again, hopes of being able to be close, and left so many weary as well as grieving, we know that light is needed. Enable us to be that light that shares with grace, less concerned with whether or not we are right in our beliefs or stance, and more concerned 
with reaching out to others with love. In a world where violence of words, of actions, of ideas, too often seems to have the upper hand, show us how to be your peacemakers so that your love and your peace is not only in our lives, but brings healing and reconciliation in each life we encounter and spreads throughout our world. Even in this time of joy and celebration, there are those who grieve, O oh God, the death of loved ones, of losses, of dreams, of hopes, of plans. Surround them all with the comfort of your love, blanketing them with a safe place to grieve, to feel all that they need to feel. Be assured of your presence, leading them to that day when once again their despair will start to give way to hope, and they'll be able to begin to see glimpses of the light of joy that you offer. We lift up those who are hurting, O oh God, in body, in mind, in spirit, and ask that you restore wholeness into those lives. Bring them strength and rest, and show us how to be your hands and feet, your hearts, your shoulders to lean on, so that they may know that you are always present with them. Gracious God, we lift up all these prayers, as well as the unspoken ones of our hearts and spirits. In the name of Jesus, using together the words he taught us, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We are given many gifts from God. And in this gift-giving season, we are reminded that we have many gifts to offer. Those of our compassion, those of our love, those of our time, and also those that we offer from our resources to others and that are available to be given to support the ministry of this congregation in the plates at the back. Let us take now the time to lift up all of our gifts, all that we have offered this week, and ask God's presence among them. Please join me in the prayer of dedication. We celebrate the gift of your love, O oh God, evident in a myriad of ways. And so we offer from what we have and who we are with joy. Pervade these gifts with your spirit so that they become part of your free, joy-filled reign. In Jesus' name, amen. I invite you to rise as able in body or in spirit and join in our closing hymn, number 144, How the Herald Angels Sing.
believe it's the proper day to take down your Christmas decorations. Or if, like Gretchen Wilson sang in the song Red Deck Woman, you keep your Christmas lights on on the porch all year round. You are always bathed in the Christmas light, whether we can see it at the time or not. For God's grace always shines upon us. God's light is always with us. And God's love is always, always surrounding us. Please join me in our benediction. Go forth and share grace upon grace in the likeness of our Sovereign, Jesus Christ. And we will share grace over waves of the sea, over all the earth, and over every person you encounter. We will strive to be as Christ. May God bless you and keep you until we meet again. Amen.